I, I'm going to talk to you today about Jewish Neo-Aramaic. Well, just a few words of introduction first about Aramaic, because I'm sure obviously most of you know basics about Aramaic, but just to, to remind you that um, Aramaic has been, is, has been attested in various historical sources for since really the, the 1000 BCE at least. Um, and it, it has, in antiquity, it was, it was a very politically very important language. Um, and it's probably at its height uh, during the so-called Achaemenid period in the, the, um, the it is the, the second half of the first millennium BCE, where um, it uh, was the official lingua franca of the Achaemenid Empire. So, um, and here we see a map of the Achaemenid Empire and the extent of the use of Aramaic as the official language. And it, essentially Achaemenid Empire stretched from the, uh, uh, the Levant all the way across Iran to Northern India. Um, and also at some point included a uh, uh, part of Egypt. Now, Aramaic was the vernacular language of uh, most people in the Mesopotamian area, in the Levant area, until the rise of Islam in the middle of the first millennium um, uh, CE. Uh, and, but it, during the Achaemenid Empire, it was it, the extent, it was actually an official language which was used across areas where people didn't actually speak Aramaic as vernacular, mainly in Iran and, and Northern India, but um, anyhow. So, uh, but with, with the, the rise of Islam and the spread of Arabic in particular, uh, the Aramaic became more and more restricted as a vernacular language, but it has survived down to the modern times in, uh, in four main subgroups or four main islands of, uh, of vernacular Aramaic speech. And these are normally referred to as the, uh, with the following terms, Central Neo-Aramaic, Northeastern Neo-Aramaic or Nina, as it's normally called, Neo-Mandaic and Western Neo-Aramaic. And here's a map showing these various locations of these subgroups. And as I say, these are, can be referred to as islands, surviving islands of Neo-Aramaic. It's as if the sort of a sea of other languages has risen. Now, it's essentially mainly Arabic. That's, that's the sea of Arabic has risen. But, and, but these um, Neo-Aramaic vernaculars have survived in these various locations. Um, the, I should say that central Neo-Aramaic and, and Nina are almost contiguous. They are only separated by the river Tigris. Western Neo-Aramaic and neo are, are, are sort of are very much isolated from uh, the other Neo-Aramaic subgroups. Um, yeah. Now, my own speciality has been the Nina dialects, uh, and the, the Nina dialects is a very constitutes a, a very very diverse subgroup. It consists of somewhere around 150 dialects. Um, so, uh, and it's that's far larger subgroup than the other Neo-Aramaic subgroups. And here we see a, a map of the Nina area. Now this, uh, as you see, these dialects are all east of the Tigris River. If you go west of the Tigris River, you're into the area of central Neo-Aramaic, so which we won't be talking about today. So Nina dialects are east of the Tigris River, and they uh, are um, spoke, well, I'm speaking essentially about the situation that existed in, at the beginning of the, uh, of the 20th century, <laughs> for reasons which I'm sure you realize, is that the, this, this dialect map has vastly changed um, over the last 100 years due to various upheavals and events. But let's say speaking at the situation at, in modern times, i.e. first the beginning of the 20th century, um, Nina dialects were spoken in northern Iraq, 
southeastern Turkey and where various parts of western Iran, ranging from the far northwest all the way down to roughly um, uh, a place called uh, Kerend in, uh, uh, in western Iran. Uh, Bijar was the easternmost uh, extent of, the, of, of Nina uh, in, in Iran. Now, what is important to note, and this is very much part of the theme of the world of Jewish languages, is that there was a communal dialect split between, in the Nina dialects, between Christian dialects and Jewish dialects, in that there were, um, these Nina dialects were spoken by Christians and Jews, but the Jewish dialects were very different from the Christian dialects. Even when the Christian dialects uh, were spoken in the same place as, as the Jewish dialects. So um, geographical contiguity did not create similarity of dialects. There was a, it was the actual different communal identity that created these linguistic differences. I should point out that the Muslims of the region speak different languages. I mean, essentially across most of the, of the Nina region, the, the dominant Muslim language is Kurdish in the modern, modern times. In parts of, north, parts of Northwestern Iran, the dominant language of, the, of Muslims now is, is mainly Azeri Turkish actually, but historically it was Kurdish. Um, and this, in a way, reflects a sort of identity, the fact that Christians and Jews continue to speak Aramaic, whereas Muslims, many of whom historically were, were converts to Islam, but the, the actual fact that they were speaking Kurdish is a sort of, uh, whereas the Jews and Christians retained Aramaic, was, uh, is all to do with communal identity. So in a way, one can say that Christians and Jews, the very fact that Christians and Jews retain Aramaic as their vernacular was a form, was an emblem of their communal identity vis-a-vis -vis, um, Muslims who spoke Iranian languages like Kurdish or Azari. And then the fact that Jewish and Christian dialects were different was a sort of is an, another way of, of expressing uh, a communal identity, communal distinction and communal identity. So here is just a, a, a chart showing, just to give you a flavor of some of the linguistic differences between, Christ, between Christian and Jewish dialects in the same place. Here we have a Christian dialect of Urmi and the Jewish dialect of Urmi. And we see that there's fundamental differences in all levels of, of, of language. So and ranging from phonology, morphology, syntax, and lexicon. So for example, the Christians would say uh, for house, they would say beta, whereas for the Jews, Jewish uh, in Nina, would, they would say bela, where the original form, the historical form of this in Aramaic would have been baitha, but you see the Christian army, the third has gone to a tut, and then Jewish army, the that has gone to an ill, a lateral, and also there's a different stress position. And basic features of morphology, like phenomenal suffixes, we get different suffixes, the possessive suffixes here, and the copula, that means that expressing the verb to be, like I am, first matching singular copula, is even in Ormi, Christian Ormi, but Ilen in Jewish Ormi, Word order is different. Uh, Christian Ormi is basically a verb object language, whereas Jewish, language, Jewish Ormi is an object verb language. And then basic lexicon is different. So big in Jewish Christian Ormi is, is Gura, whereas in Jewish Ormi is Ruwa. Corsa, hair in Christian Ormi, but Musye in uh, Jewish Ormi. Chishle, he went, but Zille. Jewish army. I'm going to play you this little clip of, of Christian army, then Jewish army. Here's Christian army. Here's this. It was Dant Gadim, Yamara, it was Litva, it was Hadan Melcher, Sankhiro Melchev Tatrayeva, 
و اخي كار خشيبه مارونه خشيبه يان ليبا رابا شو الدنيا يطاوله و اخي كار تس بابت ملتشاز بليخه تس بابو دافيدا و بزريتا بزر انا يا لي لتفالي Right, now, uh, speaker of Jewish for me. Itwa, let's talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about it. 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 Okay, so now um, a lot of these Daleks, I, uh, I and my team in Cambridge are, are, are gradually uploading in audio and grammatical features into our Northeast Neuromag database. Uh, which is uh, available online. At the moment, recordings, a lot of the recordings are accessible to the public. So that's the website there. Um, now, now I'm going to focus uh, uh, specifically on the Jewish dialects, which obviously is what this, what this talk is supposed to be about. And first of all, let's look at an issue of sub, can we, is there some kind of, is it, is it, can we subdivide or can we classify the, the Jewish dialects? And well, normally uh, the scholars would classify these dialects into two main subgroups, the Jewish dialects. One, uh, basically those which are lying to the west of the river Zab, you can see the map there, and those which are lying to the east of the, the river Zab. So those th to the west of the river Zab are often referred to as Lishana Daini, which literally means in these dialects, our language. It's just that the Dani is a sort of rather distinctive form of a genitive pronoun. Whereas those dialects lying to the east of the Zab are, typically, are normally referred to as trans-Zab dialects. So we can see the Jewish dialects, which are um, Lishana Dani, include dialects spoken in Zaho, Amedian, Dohok, are the main Jewish dialects in the Lishana Dani group. Whereas those, the trans-Zab Jewish dialects are more numerous, they're spoken across the Arbel Plain, Rwandus, Rustaka, and the northeast of Iraq, and all the way down from the northwest of Iran, all the way down to Karen in the south. Um, in fact, in Western Iran, um, there are Christian dialects only really in Salamis and Urmi, and, uh, and, and I believe there were, uh, uh, and in Sanandaj, whereas all, all the other places on the map of Western Iran are, are Jewish dialects, including those um, further south in Kerend and those further east in Bijar. These are all Jewish dialects. Um, now, okay, I uh, this is just showing you giving you a bit more detail, Lushana Dani, as I said, is Zaho and Dohok Amedia. Betanure, there's another, there's a small village in the north, just north of Amedia or Amedia. Um, yeah. Now, okay, these are the main centers, just a few quick pictures of, of the Jewish, where the Jews live. They, they, they're in Zaho uh, and the famous bridge of Dalale there. Um, and this is Amedia, this beautiful sort of hilltop town uh, in North, uh, and then here we've got a picture of a uh, synagogue in Amedia or Amedia in the 1940s. And now the Transab, here we are, I'm just going through some of these places. Rustaka, Rwanda's Koisinja, Plain of Arabel, Halabji, Sulemania, and Western Azerbaijan, province of Iran, Urmiz, Salmas, Salamas, Shinun, Nagada, Sablar. And then further south in Kurdistan and Karmanshah provinces, Sakas, Sanandaj, Karen are the main dialects. And here again, just a map showing you where they are. Um, and here's some nice pictures <laughs> in Rwandus. Very, a very small Jewish community used to be up there with very few speakers. And I, I was able to find a couple of speakers from Rwandus some years ago in Israel. I think it's almost quite likely to be extinct now. I'm not, not I don't know anybody who, who's, who's living from Rwanda now. Here are some of the Jews from Rwanda in, two, in 1905. And in the town of Sulaimania, where there's a Jewish community. There are um, Sanandaj in Western Iran. Now, as um, the Jews, um, 
the Jews of Iraq essentially left Iraq in the 19, early 1950s, like all the Jews of Iraq, including those from places like Baghdad, so that, um, and migrated to, to the state of Israel. Um, and those of Iran, many of them left in the 1950s, but um, they, some of them remained, particularly in Western Iran, in, in Umi, and um, particularly in Sun and Daj, for example, they remained until the uh, Islamic Revolution in, in Iran uh, in the late 70s. Uh, and then a lot of them moved to Israel or to Los Angeles. <laughs> there's, there's, there, there was a large migration there. Um, and um, the, the situation, the current situation of the Jewish Near make in terms of the vitality of it is that many of the Daleks are, have actually become, gone extinct, become extinct uh, over the, I mean, I started working on these Daleks as a field worker in the early 1990s. Uh, and then it was possible to find elderly speakers of quite a lot of the smaller dialects, but now most of these smaller dialects are extinct. Um, the, uh, the point is, though, that, that when these, one should always be cautious about saying a dialect's extinct. Um, I mean, about three years ago, or just before the pandemic, in fact, I, I heard, I, I, um, I'd always assumed that there was, that there were, one of these dialects, the Jewish dialects, was a dialect of Bashkale in eastern Turkey. Now, I'd always assumed that this dialect had become extinct because it's a very small community of Jew Jews, and uh, I was not aware of any Bashkale speakers in Israel. But then I was contacted by somebody, you know, by email randomly, who said that my grandfather, who lives in Istanbul, speaks Aramaic, and he's from Bashkale. So I rushed over to Istanbul and I found these people and this is their family. This is an old photograph and I, I, I recorded them and here just to play a clip of this is what one of the, there's an old couple and this is the, 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 um, the grandmother of this, this man who contacted me who's speaking at this dialect of Bashkele. Rabba Rabba Yani Chiran Saray Hilton Rabba Rabbi Otalid. Yeah, so um, you're never sure whether the dialect's extinct, but um, what is absolutely sure is that one of the most important things that a linguist can be doing is documenting endangered languages. Uh, of course, this applies to all endangered languages across the world, but certainly a lot of these Jewish. Aramaic dialects are highly endangered. Um, so this is what I've been devoting myself to over the last two or three decades, essentially trying to document uh, the uh, Jewish and also the Christian dialects. Now, what does documentation mean? Documentation means not only recording somebody, but also but writing a grammar of the language. That means we should require uh, intensive interaction with a, a speaker about various different uh, uh, um, areas of the grammar. Then creating a text corpus, that means recording people speak, tell stories, tell, tell memories of, of described life and, and culture, and then transcribing and translating them. And the transcriptions is a very arduous task, I have to say. And then the third thing is creation of the lexicon. So we go three components and to that is maximal documentation. Uh, and it's a lot of work. And in fact, a lot of younger linguists feel they don't want to do it because the, the sad fact is that not only because it's a lot of work, it's not the, that's not the main reason, but the sad fact is that Universities, typically university positions don't necessarily, um, there are not very many university positions in language documentation and um, there are various, you can talk about that afterwards, I think, reasons why there's not enough documentation going on. Now, let, I'll press on. Um, so 
Okay, Jewish Nearamaic, uh, which is spoken today, um, is it, essentially it's a vernacular. However, there have been some, um, there are some written forms of it, uh, but these are only used by learned members of the community and only in a few of the communities. And crucially, these only really started to be written down in the, from about the 17th century. This was a feature of the Ottoman Empire where many vernacular languages began to be written down in the 17th century. Um, and um, here's, a, here's just a, a, a manuscript of, of, of a 17th century Jewish near text. However, the actual history of spoken Nina, Jewish and Christian dialects, is much, much older. It goes all the way back. I mean, the variety of ways, various pieces of evidence that demonstrate it goes all the way back to antiquity. Um, in fact, some of the dialects have Akkadian words in them, which they must presumably got through, probably through language contact in, in antiquity when Akkadian was still a spoken language. So they're very, very ancient, they're ancient vernacular. So when, when one talks about a modern vernacular language, one shouldn't say, well, okay, I'm not interested in modern languages, I'm interested in ancient languages, because a modern vernacular is simply a, has ancient roots and often preserves aspects such of an ancient language which have disappeared in other sources. So let me just go back then to this dialect split between Christian and Jewish dialects. So I'm, as I, the point is that this is not an issue of geography, this is a social factor. This is, this is the, the factor that creates these differences social and it, it um, and the extent to which the change is diffused uh, across the communities is first and foremost um, depends on social networks and the Christian and Jewish communities constitute two entirely different social networks and identity groups and uh, so that's the main point. Now, it's an interesting fact that these social networks, I say, the fact that two dialects are together doesn't mean to say because they're just geographically together doesn't make them similar. It's a social network, but the social networks themselves can extend over a vast distance. So uh, it's an interesting, for example, here, I've got um, a group of Jewish dialects at the top there, which uh, are all in a, Northern Iraq, essentially, better Jewish, better J means Jewish, Jewish, better Nori, Jewish Ahmadiyya, and Jewish Nerua, but they're not that close. I mean, they're separated by several miles, quite, quite a, you know, in terms of, you know, the pre modern period, it would be probably a day's travel between each of them. But they're very, very similar in all. I, mean, I won't go through, I've got time to go through all these different grammatical and lexical features, but, but if you compare it with a, a Christian dialect, in the same area, you see all of the three Jewish dialects are very uniform, but they're quite different in many of these features on the Christian dialect. So that is all an issue of social network. It shows that the Jewish social networks extended over a, la a long, a large geographical area. Um, now, um, so the Nina dialects, however, and this is an interesting fact in terms of, if you like, Christian Jewish relations. The Nina dialect exhibits some signs of social contact between Christian and Jewish communities. So, although there were different social networks, the language, I mean, so we're talking about the way language casts light on social relations. So, we've, all, we've already seen how the distinctness and the structure of the languages. It, express different, reflect different social networks, but they also reflect some degree of social contact between Christian and Jewish communities. And but this is reflected by linguistic convergence between Christian and Jewish dialects in the same region. So although they're distinct, there is some degree of convergence. For example, the Jews and Christians of a place called Koisenjak, which is in Northern Iraq, when they want to express a progressive they are, um, they use a similar construction. They use this particle la, which is actually ultimately a copula particle. La shate or la shate, la shate, 
when the Christian, when the Jewish died, he is drinking. In the Barua region, that is to say that there's a region we've just been looking at, actually, there's that chart I saw before, that they, 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 the progressive is expressed in a different way, but the Jewish and the Christian communities, the dialects expect, expressed in a similar way. So holish daya, basically a copula plus an infinitive construction, ilesh daya, the Jewish betanuri, which is just a neighbor of Barua. Um, now, this, this convergence must have come about by a, some degree of bilingualism, because that, you know, languages only converge if there's bilingualism. Therefore, there was in social interaction. So, and there, and there's other evidence for this social interaction. Obviously, the first clear, obvious one is just talking to the surviving speakers who will tell you about what social interaction there was. For example, I work with some people from the Christian communities of Barua, and they, one of the, my informants told me that when I was, when he was a little boy, he used to run over the fields to the, the village of Betanure, which is the Jewish village, just across this, the fields, and go and sit at the feet of the rabbi in Betanure and listen to stories for the other Jewish children. And um, so they were very close and friendly relations. And they, the, the Jews and Christians would refer to each other as kariwa, this term which means a kinsman, literally somebody close. So, that, but this is all, the point I'm trying to make is that this is all, this convergence, this social interaction, this relationship, this empathy, if you like, across the two communities is expressed by the language. So if you're a linguist, you can, you know, a language can tell you a lot about social relations and, and as, as we're going to see in a minute also about history and this is very important when we're dealing with languages which have no really no or communities which have no historical records in, in in forms of writing but there's an interesting thing about the jews of betanur is that although they were clearly they were communicating with their christian neighbors in aramaic and let's talk about convergence they were um uh, they did have a way of trying to sort of block a, a or put a restraint on on social kind of social convergence and, and they had they did this by having a, a secret cryptic language which they would sometimes use to make sure that Christians didn't understand them um, so it was a sort of restraint <laughs> uh, to maintain their social identity it was sort of like a break um, a social, uh, yeah. Okay, now, in this region, uh, there are a lot of languages in contact with the Nima dialects, and here we have a list of them. Kurdish in its various dialects, Kurmanji, Suran in particular, Gorani, which is a, a, an Iranian, another Iranian language, it's a Kurdish and a Gorani, Iranian language. Gorani was um, at one point very widely spoken across the region. It, it's now only survives in a few pockets, pockets, but we're going to see shortly that Gorani really had a big impact on, on Nina dialects. But um, although now it's in, in at some early point in history, other languages in the region that have had some impact on the Nina dialects include Armenian and Indo-European language, Arabic, Semitic language, Turkic, and Persian. Obviously, uh, an Iranian language, um, Persian. So. Now, an important point to note is that one can sometimes uh, see historical layering of contact languages. For example, in central Kurdistan region, i.e. northern Iraq, essentially, uh, and some, or some parts of western Iran, um, the, uh, where now the, the, the Kurdish dialect known as Sorani is, is spoken, and an earlier period, as I was saying, it was mainly but Gorani was spoken. So we've got this language shift of Gorani to Sorani as the contact language. And Urmi region, Kurdish was originally the main contact language, but now it's been replaced by Turkic or Azeri Turkish. So the, the layering of languages in contact. Now, contacting Jewish changes in Jewish near make are generally more advanced. Uh, I mean, the, the, an interesting point is that 
in the Jewish targets, they're generally more advanced. These changes that occur due to contact are generally more advanced than in the neighboring Christian dialects. And also the Jewish dialects give a, um, as evidence of sub earlier substrates, which have now disappeared. And also studying the Jewish dialects can show something about migration history. So let's look at something of this. First of all, something about the, the professions of the Jews. And the Jews, uh, the Aramaic speaking Jews were mainly dwelt in towns, whereas the Christians typically were agriculturists living in villages. The Jews were small traders, goldsmiths, tailors, weavers, and dyers. They had close contact with the Iranian urban population, and the dialects were heavily influenced by Iranian languages. And it's one of the reasons that it seems to be more influenced than the Christian dialects is the probably their status of, of, as urban dwellers rather than uh, rural dwellers. Now let's just look at a couple of case studies about showing how the Jewish Nina dialects have converged more with the contact languages than the Christian dialects. Now, in the Jew in the dialects of the Orumi region, and that's to say the Nina dialects, there is what's known as suprasegmental pharyngealization of the entire word, uh, which developed from the spreading of of emphasis, this is the Semitic term for pharyngealization, from an emphatic consonants, which is characteristic of neo aramaic dialects in Iraq. Well, basically, um, in, um, in neo aramaic dialects in Iraq, such as Zacho, you see at the bottom of the screen, a Jewish Zacho, um, you would have an emphatic consonant. This is a top indicate transcribed by the T or the dot underneath it. I mean, for those of you Semitists, you'll be aware of the, what we're talking about. This is a pharyngealized consonant that is with tongue root retraction into the upper pharynx. So you get top. Now, this in, a da in our dialects in Iraq, in Iraq, this resulted typically in spreading of this feature of pharyngealization across at least the syllable, but usually not the rest of the word. But in the Ormi region, this pharyngealization of a, of a single letter or segment or consonant was replaced by a pharyngealization of the whole word, basically. And this seems to be under the influence of Turkish vowel harmony in the region. Um, however, the Jewish Ormi exhibits more ex extensive assimilation to Turkic backness harmony, that is the, the harmony of I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about it in a minute, of, of, of vowels in Turkic than, than does Christian army. Here we see an Azeri, a vowel chart of the Azeri vowels. And the basic point here is that in Azeri Turkic, um, vowels harmonize for backness. So you get in the word all vowels are front or all vowels are back. So you say, sufra. Is, is, is you have the U and the A vowel, this little shva is pronounced, it's the Azeri orthography for A. The vowels are all front, but susamak, all the vowels are back. Sundulmek, all the vowels are front, but solmak, all the vowels are back. So you get this backness harmony of, of all vowels essentially. Now in Jewish army, the, the opposition between pharyngealized and non-pharyngealized vowels, that is to say back versus front, includes low vowels and high and mid-round vowels. So you say things like nershan, where the, the original o is fronted, er, and a is front. So that, in other words, you've got front, all vowels are front, but palota, all vowels are back. Now, Although, you know, this is originally a distinction between pharyngealized, non-pharyngealized versus pharyngealized. However, it's somehow been matched with Turkic backness harmony. So you get all vowels front or all vowels back. And this crucially affects not only the low vowel, a, ah, in Jewish army, but also higher vowels, like o ah, goes, is fronted to er in non-pharyngealized words. And o, like malu, their village, the original U is fronted in a non pharyngealized word, but taluba, it, 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 all vowels are back. So it affects all vowels, uh, all 
it affects certainly not only low valves, but also on ooh. Now, Christian or me, the pharyngealization in results in backness harmony only of the low valves. So you say, su, you say, sura. You don't say sura, you say sura. And you say, but sluto. So basically, oh, you say, o, o, you don't say, erdi. You have o, which is back, and e, which is front. But ho, Hola, so you, the art is back and the uh, in pharyngealized word. But so pharyngealization doesn't bring about, or lack of pharyngealization doesn't bring about fronting of back rounded vowels, essentially. Whereas in, in Jewish army, it does. So uh, therefore, Jewish army has, has converged more with the uh, feature of a zeri backness harmony than Christian army. That's the point. Now, Jewish army Nina has got uh, has got a basic OV word order, object verb word order, like the contact language of Kurdish and Azeri. Christian army has got a basic VO order with object fronting for pragmatic purposes. So another example of Jewish Nina being closer, converging more with contact languages. Christian or now. That's the point about close, different degrees of convergence. Now about how reflection of, of different migration histories. Christian army has unaspirated stops. Jewish army has no, has no unaspirated stops. So Christian army would have a series of triads of, 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 of stops where you have an aspirated p, an unaspirated b, and a voiced b, a t, d, and d. Etc. So uh, that is under the influence of Eastern Armenian, uh, and which was spoken obviously further north in the Armenian region. And this is also found in Kurmanji in the northern Kurdish dialect, which, but the, the origin of it seems to have been in Eastern Armenian, or Armenian basically. So it's a feature of a northern region, uh, whereas it doesn't exist in. Um, in Jewish army. So the point is, therefore, this gives the sense that gives us an, a clue that the, the Christian dialect seems to have come from the north, whereas the um, Jewish dialect seems to have come from the south uh, in terms of migration history. Another feature of the interdentals of Jewish army we mentioned earlier, Bela, the house from Betha, Ela, festival from Eda. And our, our lateral is developed from these interdentals, but the intermediary seems to have been a duh. So, um, which I haven't got time to go into now, but this essentially is a feature of lenition of a D, which is a feature of the Zagros, languages of the Zagros region, Iranian and also Turkic languages of the Zagros region. Uh, uh, and this, this L is results from this so called Zagros D effect. Uh, but it's not a feature of um, this feature of Jewish language is not found in the Iranian Turkic language of the region. It's, a, it's only found in the Zagros. Therefore, the Jews, another reason to think that the Jews of Ormi migrated from the south, whereas the Christians of Ormi migrated from the north. And here we've got a, uh, a, a map showing that, uh, how a language can show us something about. Uh, migration history, which otherwise is entirely undocumented in historical sources. Another case study quickly is Sam and Dadj. We've got Jewish and Christian dialects spoken there at least until the uh, first half of the 20th century. Um, the Jewish San and Dadj replicates the alignment of Iranian languages of the region, whereas Christian San and Dadj does not. I'm talking about the verbal system. So Jewish San and Dadj has a different inflection of past transitive and past intransitive. Uh, so we get things like grishlu means they pulled where the subject is expressed by an oblique suffix lu. Klimi they arose where the subject of the intransitive verb has a direct suffix. So it has different inflectional suffixes for transitive and intransitive. Uh, and this is based, this is this is matching what we get in Duke Sanandaj Kurdish way, we get the same transitive and intransitive verbs have got different inflectional suffixes. The, the transitive has an oblique and the intransitive has a, has a direct, and that is, uh, reflects 
a form of ergative alignment, uh, which uh, perhaps I won't go into now for lack of time. But but the main point to me making that, that the Christian son and dodge has actually doesn't have this form of distinction between transitive and intransitive inflection. It has a single form of inflection with a loo, uh, which is an oblique inflection, which again, I haven't got time to just go into detail, but the point here is that the um, this is the more original um, profile of Nina, where you get past verbs are all inflected, both transitive and intransitive with, with, with um, oblique suffixes. Whereas the Jewish dialect is an innovation, and that innovation has, it reflects a greater degree of convergence with contact language curtis. So, um, early substrate, the Jewish son and Daj reflects extensive influence from Gorani. Now, although now Kurdish is spoken in son and Daj, so this contact induced change therefore took place at an earlier period when Gorani was the dominant contact language in the area. So, in other words, enshrined within Jewish son and Daj is a history of, of the language situation in the son and Daj region. In other words, it shows that. The Jews originally spoke Gorani uh, uh, as their contact language rather than Kurdish, where although Gorani now has disappeared from the region. And in fact, in the late in the last generations of the Jews, the, the informants I worked with all spoke only Nina and Kurdish and Persian, but they didn't speak Gorani. So here is another way in which a language can preserve something about the language history. And we have a lot of loan words in Jewish son and Daj from Gorani, for example, which are different from Kurdish. For example, here we just a few examples. Um, now, an interesting feature of loan words in Jewish son and Daj is that, in fact, some of these loan words from Iranian are not coming from Gorani or local son and Daj Kurdish, but they're coming from Bahdini Kurdish, which is, is a sort of a type of Kurdish, northern Kurdish, spoken essentially in northern Iraq or further, much, much further north in Iran. And for example, here we've got a list of Bahdini loanwords in Jewish and Daj, which are distinct from San and Daj Kurdish. And these loanwords constitute evidence that the Jews of San and Daj must have migrated at an earlier period from northern Iraq. Um, something like that. Because that the beginning of that arrow is, is basically the beginning of the ba current Bahdini region. And we know that you know the Jews of Iran of this region did migrate, must have, must have migrated from Iraq. I mean, there must be the, the heartland or the homeland must have been Iraq because for other reasons. I mean, one of them is that the Jews, the, the, all the Jewish dialects say from basically from, from Bokan all the way further south, all of those Sakas, Bijar, Sanandaj, Qadr, Hassan, I mean, all of those are very, very similar. And when you get this lack of diversity, that always reflects a, a, a much more recent situation. It's like, whereas, you know, when you get a clustering of, of many diverse styles, except that reflects greater antiquity. So uh, there are there's other evidence that there is migration, but these, Studying closely history of loanwords can show you how something about migration, you know, the, the actual geographical kind of coordinates of this migration. Okay, so to conclude, a um, few remarks. You see, we've seen that Jewish Neo Aramaic dialects differ from Christian dialects, and this reflects social barriers between the two communities or different social networks. There are, however, some shared innovations in Jewish and Christian dialects of the same region. And this reflects some social contact. The Jewish dialects have undergone greater convergence with the language of the Muslims in the region than the Christian dialects. And an in, a linguistic investigation of the dialects casts light on the history of the communities, which is not known from other sources. The dialects exhibit evidence of substrate languages that existed at an earlier period and they exhibit evidence of the history of migration of the communities.